Tu connais Je sais pas. Ah, c'est pas grave. Ah, c'est pas grave. Ah, c'est Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, uh, our real pleasure to start with uh, this session. Um, we are a little bit late uh, due to the circumstances. Uh, this session around uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, Olga uh, Stefanishnaya, uh, who is with her right now. She has just arrived. Prime Minister, thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. Uh, due to your personal constraints, um, it's um, it's a great honor to to have uh, to have you this afternoon at AT3. Um, I will uh, introduce you very briefly, but before that, I would like to remind that uh, this session is organized uh, in the framework of the partnership uh, between the new uh, European Centre based in Kiev and E3. And uh, of course, it's uh, an opportunity for me to, to transfer my warmest regards to Alena, Leo, and, and uh, Sergei. Um, Prime Minister, uh, I should say very quickly that uh, you were trained in law and uh, you, uh, in, um, in law and European law. You worked for a while in the Ministry of Justice. And uh, as uh, everyone knows now, you played a critical and a decisive role uh, for Ukraine's EU membership uh, bid to, due to your skills. And now, as we know, the uh, Ukraine is candidate to the uh, EU and is also candidate to NATO. And that's your portfolio. And that's uh, uh, on that part, uh, we will uh, uh, listen to you very carefully. Uh, I should have, I should add one point. Uh, you have paid a real uh, personal tribute to the Russian uh, aggression, and please uh, receive our sincere uh, condolences uh, for this. Prime Minister, I would like to, to start uh, the discussion with uh, my colleagues Tatiana uh, castouillet vajan with a very with three big questions, I would say, or general question to let you brief as you want uh, uh, after them. The very first one is simply to give your analysis uh, of the situation on the ground uh, nine months uh, after the uh, uh, aggression. How could you describe uh, the situation? The second issue is to know your uh, outlook for the coming year. How do you see uh, the situation during winter, after winter, before summer? What sort of uh, planning, political planning, I mean, of course, uh, you, you do have in mind. Uh, and last but not least, uh, what are your expectations uh, regarding the EU on, on, on one side and NATO on the other side um, for the current situation and for the, the, the coming year? So I step by, uh, Prime Minister, and let you the floor uh, at this stage. Thank you very much once again for being with us. Thank you so much. Um, I'll try uh, to be relatively brief to, to, to leave the floor for a uh, the discussion and the questions, especially giving the, 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 um, uh, the group of people uh, gathered, uh, gathered today for, uh, for, for this dialogue. It will be extremely interesting to have the exchange of views and to hear the, the understanding or your side. I would start, um, I, I think it's very important to start by saying uh, obvious things, which, uh, which should be um, as a baseline for, for, for a discussion. So uh, first and foremost, uh, for now we have the 10th month of um, resistance um, uh, against full-scale Russian military aggression over my country. And every month of this resistance have led us to uh, two major understandings. First is that Ukraine uh, is winning and is going to win this war, uh, whatever it takes and whatever long it will last. There's no other way to have the outcome of this war about Ukraine winning because we are 
um, we have shown the, uh, the strong resistance, the strong commitment, the strong ability, and uh, we have been backed up by all democratic world. The second very important element that we can um, identify clearly right now that Russia has failed to succeed in any kind of field they have been trying to succeed on the battlefield, on the economic field, and on the uh, propaganda field. So uh, basically every uh, military operation, every military plan which has been declared or targeted to be implemented by Russian Federation has failed, starting from the uh, getting control over Ukraine in three days, which are the three days which are all, uh, already lasting for 10 months, uh, secondly, by various attempts to force uh, Ukraine to surrender, to force Ukrainian people to surrender, to force Ukrainian leadership to surrender by massive terrorizing uh, a population, by targeted genocide policies against Ukrainian people, just to remember the beginning of uh, war and the Mariupol where, uh, where there has no been room for reaching the agreement with the Russian Federation on the Green Corridors, and more than 20,000 of civilian people has basically been murdered targetly by the Russian Federation within less than one month period. So, uh, and um, now massive uh, missile attacks uh, on Ukrainian energy and municipal infrastructure, which are also uh, targeted to demoralize uh, Ukrainian people and force us to surrender based on the Russian ultimatums, which, as you know, will leave not only will lead not only to the collapse of Ukraine as a, as a government, but also to the collapse of all the unity and the system of defense and stability in all um, Europe. And uh, uh, also not even speaking about the mobilization, uh, announced mobilization, partial mobilization by Russian Federation, which has led to nothing but mounting number of Russia casualties uh, in the war that uh, at, th at this moment, particularly more than 90,000 of Russian soldiers has been killed uh, in Ukrainian soul as, uh, soul as, uh, as part of, uh, of this war. And um, uh, this mobilization has uh, a part of mounting number of casualties on their side has led to no single success on the battlefield on the opposite counteroffensive operations of Ukraine have been successful, taking into account all the south of Ukraine and deoccupation of uh, the Kherson region, which has led to lightening the pressure to other parts of the south of Ukraine, like Mykolaiv and Odessa, and uh, lifting the threat from attack on the Transnistrian, uh, from the Transnistrian area to uh, to Ukraine by Russian forces. So, um, so every single military operation and goal declared by Russia has been failed by Ukrainian armed forces and our unity as, a, as a international partners uh, with targeted sanctions, economic pressure, uh, with a, a targeted, uh, targeted messaging and massive military support to Ukraine, which has been provided not always in a timely, uh, but in a coordinated me measure through the established Rammstein format. So this is where we are. Uh, at this point, uh, speaking about any plans for the next year or the years ahead um, is a very complicated task. But uh, by the end of the day, we know that there is, there is a number of end goals which should be reached by Ukraine, but also by a wider international communities. And uh, the, the first and ultimate goal is the restoration of Ukrainian territorial integrity and sovereignty in its borders of 1991, which we consider as the baseline for a further discussion with the Russian Federation, but also as the baseline for restoring back the dialogue with the Russian Federation on any conditions related to the global security and European security. And also reaching this first goal is the, ba is the baseline for any uh, discussion related to how to preserve the peace in the European continent and, and um, to build a sustainable and secure uh, environment 
in in the region in the eastern europe but also uh in the region but also in uh in uh, in um, uh, in europe generally and also reaching this first go uh, goal is the ba baseline for uh closing the door for everybody who have the appetite to follow Russian example. And, um, uh, and it is very important to have this broader understanding. So uh, however long it might take, this goal should be reached. And uh, it is not Russian Federation at this stage who decides when this goal could be reached. It is Ukraine and its international partners and allies who can now hold this file and make sure that this goal is reached through our joint efforts of economic, political, diplomatic, diplomatic and military nature. Uh, secondly, uh, it's very important to already now start the discussion uh, about inability of Russian Federation or any other player who might think uh, that they can follow Russian example. Um, how to make sure that such countries do not have the appetite for any further aggression when this war is over. And here is uh, the goal which could not only be reached by Ukraine itself, but it could be reached with some, uh, some methods and instruments which are now to be discussed. First and foremost, strengthening the defense capacity of Ukraine and now uh, having the dialogue on the development of the defense industries and considering uh, this as a part of the security guarantees for Ukraine to making Ukraine military strong enough to avoid any potential further aggression open against our country in any, uh, in any uh, outreach future. Secondly, uh, political and military alliance between Ukraine and those partners who have been stepping up with, uh, with Ukraine um, uh, as standing for the democratic values and standing for the values we all stand for. And we think that the best way to avoid any appetite for aggression is making the decision that Ukraine becomes a member of NATO, uh, being compliant with all the necessary standards and being capable not only to seek uh, to seek for the protection of the allies, but contributing to, to the mutual uh, collective European security and being a strong and reliable and a competitive player there. Uh, and in this context, whatever sad it sounds, 10 months of this full-scale war have already shown that Ukraine bears a number of very unique elements which could strengthen the alliance. For example, we have the most sufficient and most professional and experienced artillery forces in Ukraine, which is not the case among other players, and uh, unique uh, cybersecurity policies and approaches which we use. And this is something where we can contribute significantly to strengthen the collective European defense. And thirdly, of course, um, reconsidering the accountability of the Russian Federation, including financial accountability of the Russian Federation for uh, intention and then enforcement of this intention to start the full-scale war against a sovereign country in the 21st century. It's a key element not only for Ukraine, it's a key element not only for their reparations and the massive accountability for the war crimes and crimes against civilians committed in Ukraine. It's a very important important element of the security of the Europe to make sure that um, uh, the new leadership of the Russian Federation, whenever it happens, and uh, uh, for years and decades ahead, knows that there is a price to be paid for the crimes committed and for the wars started. Uh, and it is absolutely essential element at this stage. Of course, um, we understand that the winter will be complicated, it will be hard, it might cause a number of various consequences, including um, uh, additional outflow of Ukrainian people to European Union if uh, Russians would reach the goal 
of uh, blackout through the territory of Ukraine uh, following the missiles attacks. It, uh, uh, it is a threat we are facing on a weekly basis. We have already um, seen eight waves of massive missile attacks from 70 to 90 missiles per day. Uh, but at this stage, uh, Russians has still failed to um, reach their goal. And Ukrainian people are not demoralized they are concentrated and we are energized by those people who have been living in occupation for 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 months in Izum, in Mariupol, in Busha and in Irpin. They were deprived of water, of electricity, of gas, and they had only one, uh, one uh, target to survive. Uh, and those people who are now deprived of this basic right, they at least not submitted to a massive civilian, uh, massive war crimes of the Russian army against them. They are not tortured, they are not raped, and they are not uh, forced to serve the Russian uh, regime. So uh, having no light is not the, the most important problem that we could uh, count on uh, from the Russian Federation. But, but still, uh, the, the price for reconstruction of this infrastructure, damaged infrastructure would be extremely high. And it's very important that international partners send a clear signal to Russian Federation that it is them to be paying for that and that it has not been causing any effect they've been targeting to. Uh, so we have no doubt that um, uh, winter will be hard for Ukraine, it will be hard for Europe, but we, we have no other chance but to overcome it uh, from one side, but from the other side, even having a severe winter time here in Ukraine, it does not uh, affect the dynamics of uh, the military operations in Ukraine. It doesn't affect its speed and, uh, and efficiency. So uh, Russians could not rest, uh, uh, rest uh, and take a pause to regroup. They could only rest in peace being affected by Ukrainian armed forces and uh, thrown back to the, uh, to the borders of the, of the Russian Federation. So uh, this is the spirit that we have here and the perspective we have on the afterward time. And just to end up my very long presentation, I want to, uh, to focus on the understanding that throughout the period of war, Ukrainian government, uh, Ukrainian parliament and Ukrainian local authorities has remained fully operational 24, 24 seven. So we managed to preserve the governments to uh, the governance to ensure social and medical functions of the stage. But also we continue the reform agenda to make sure that we are prepared for the victory and we are able to revive and restore ourselves soon after the war is over. And that's why we are really happy that this um, very strong resilience has been seen by EU member states and Ukraine has been granted the candidate status and we are working heavily to deliver on all seven recommendations to start the accession talks. But also we hope that the appeal of Ukraine to join NATO would be officially considered by allies. And we understand that this is not the answer uh, which could be uh, not the question which should be answered very soon, but at least the process should be there. So I will stop here. Uh, there are many things happening on a daily basis, but I think it was really important. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, for this um, very comprehensive um, analysis and presentation. Before uh, giving the floor to Tatiana Kastouyeva Jean, I invite uh, our participants to use a QA uh, file if they want to, to interact uh, with you. And uh, if you allow me, uh, Tatiana, I, I, I would like just to, to, to add a question, maybe with a, a, a shorter answer on your side, if it's possible, Prime Minister. Uh, what do you expect from uh, the EU and from NATO just before uh, winter, in terms of what sort of supplies do you, do you expect or do you need? Because we will have this, uh, this conference uh, in, um, uh, in mid in mid December, on 13th of, of December, uh, what sort of needs would you like to to, to formulate at this uh, at this stage? I give you the floor, and after that, I go to to Tatiana. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Oh, yes. Sorry. Uh... I mean, 
Sh should I reflect now? Yes, please. If, if you can, please. Okay. Uh, well, uh, there are there are two major uh, uh, things that uh, that we need for for the winter period. First and foremost is the uh, additional military support uh, and particularly air defense systems, which enable us to protect our skies and, sh and shell back Russian missiles. Um, just uh, two days ago, Russia has launched a, a new attack and shelled 70 missiles and 60 of them has been shelled back, which means that they never reached their goals. So uh, military support is essential. Air defense systems are essential. But at the same time, um, uh, on EU line, at the level of the financial and economic support, it is essential that we are able to uh, receive um, the support necessary to restore damaged infrastructure. And first and foremost, this is uh, when we're talking about the generators uh, of various types to support the, uh, the, uh, the power plants, but also enabling our people to uh, remain with electricity uh, throughout the reparation works are taking plan, um, taking um, Mm, taking uh, place. We have formally shared the wish list or the needs list uh, throughout governments, but also the major call on our side is to the industries uh, who have directly uh, the, the hardware that, that we need. And it's not that much time, that, that's not that much about having finances to purchase it. It's about having the necessary hardware. So we call on mobilizing the efforts of the European industries to produce use and provide Ukraine with the necessary and vital elements of hardware that is uh, that is needed for us. Thank you very much. Tatiana. Uh, thank you very much, Olga. I have the first question about uh, the uh, NATO candidate. Because uh, just before the round of negotiation in Istanbul in March, Ukraine uh, seemed uh, to be agree with the neutral status. The situation uh, has uh, changed a lot. Uh, so Ukraine uh, submitted an application uh, to, to join NATO. Uh, so I would like to ask you the question about the chances that uh, Ukraine have uh, to uh, become uh, one day a member, member of uh, NATO. Is it something uh, negotiable for you today or uh, really not? And the second question is about uh, uh, the uh, armament, the military equipment uh, that uh, Ukraine is, uh, is receiving. Uh, there is some warning here in Europe about the potential illegal traffic. Uh, what are the precise mechanisms that you put in place to control uh, the arms that is uh, coming into, into Ukraine? And the, the, the third and the last question is about uh, Germany's and France uh, policies and support uh, in this uh, war. Uh, it was a uh, real political leadership of this uh, duo, Fran France uh, and uh, Germany. Are you disappointed in some way by uh, the, the reactions? Uh, do you feel that uh, the center of power in Europe is shifting more uh, toward, uh, toward Poland, uh, Romania and uh, Baltic states? Thank you. Prime Minister, just let me remind to our participants that they, they can ask you questions through Q&A. Uh, after your response to the question from Tatiana, I will give the floor to Gustav Selska from the um, Poland's embassy in Paris. So the floor is yours, Prime Minister. Thank you so much. Um, uh, well, basically, uh, first and the second question about the membership to NATO and the, and the role of France of Germany, they're a bit part of the uh, or of the same puzzle. I try to to uh, to put it this uh, this way. So, uh, NATO membership is not uh, cannot be uh, considered uh, separately from a broader understanding what would be the composition of the European security architecture. Uh, after this war is over. And uh, uh, if we are playing the Russian narratives and serve their ultimatums, that means that uh, such organization as, not, as NATO doesn't need it at all because Russia would be given a signal that they dominate the geopolitics, that they reach their goals and that whatever has been happening on the territory of Ukraine has been legitimized and legalized. 
So uh, it's it's not about the membership itself. And if we're talking about the pre prevail of international law, about the prevail of the democratic values and uh, uh, holding Russia accountable, that automatically means that there's no room for any discourse which would lead to playing Russian ultimate ultimatums related to um, uh, the geopolitical or political choice of our country. So uh, as, uh, as part of the discussion, there could be modalities of this membership which would arrive from the security situation and the outcome of the war and the modalities of this outcome. This could be discussable, but it's not about uh, the sovereign choice of my country. The same um, uh, I can apply to the to Germany and, and, and France. Uh, of course, uh, at some stages, these countries played vital role. For example, uh, France played a very important role in decision of granting Ukraine candidate statues. And uh, Germany has made a political decision to provide Ukraine with the military support. It's really important, but um, uh, we are expecting that the two major European countries, which has a tendency to identify them as the leaders of Europe, would not go into fragmented approach. So we see the tendency trying to fragment different pieces of the discourse like um, uh, security guarantees for the Russian Federation, NATO membership to Ukraine, military support, and etc. This is all part of one file. And speaking of the leadership, the leadership should have the comprehensive answer of what should be the, the security in Europe and uh, what should we do to end this war? And, uh, and what should Russia, uh, what should be the plan for the Russian Federation? Is everything I've told before, the points I've told uh, before uh, on the after war period. And if at, at some point Russia would uh, give uh, uh, the floor to have uh, the, uh, the security arrangement, this could be part of the deal, but this could not be uh, separated or fragmented as, as an essential element. So uh, we expect the comprehensive and overwhelming leadership from these countries, but not the fragmented one. And on the military support, uh, indeed, this question has been uh, raised uh, a number of times at the various uh, platforms, but uh, having um, uh, in mind the, the scale and, uh, and amount of the military support we get. Uh, we should not forget that Ukraine and US uh, and the plus 50 uh, allies are part of the Rammstein format. And this is exactly format which ensures the transparency, transparency, accountability and coordination of the military support. And it's not only the format which uh, um, functions uh, on the monthly basis at the level of the meeting of the ministers of defense is the daily format uh, with the secretariat, with the necessary coordination and, uh, and exchange of information. So this top to down transparency in the process. At the, um, and at the same time in Ukraine, we have uh, the clear understanding that uh, there is an accountability of uh, utilization of the elements of, uh, of the military support we are provided by international partners from delivery to its utilization on the battlefield. Believe me, this is all a very detailed protocols uh, which are enforced. They are nearly automatized, but moreover, uh, even before the full scale war, they have been aligned with the NATO standards and that's the way they are functioning. So, um, so there might be individual and minor case, but they have been investigated by our Ministry of Defense. And believe me, if there would be at least a small um, uh, a small doubt, if there will be even a smallest doubt that there is lack of transparency on Ukrainian side, I don't think that we would be in a situation of having doubling uh, military support uh, from, uh, from our partners. Thank you very much. So I open now the, the discussion to the to the participants. I will start with uh, Mr. Gustav uh, Selska from the Poland Embassy in France. I will move after that to Mr. Uh, Guillaume Laurent, and uh, after that to Mr. Francis uh, Gelipter. So um, Gustav, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your speech, uh, Madam Prime Minister. So my question concerns uh, 
the current situation with the grain in Ukraine? Because I think this subject has disappeared from the media in the last month or so. But from what I remember, the the humanitarian the uh, the corridors going throughout the Black Sea to to export uh, the grain from Ukraine they have been only prolonged for a certain period of time, which is why I wanted to ask you uh, what is the current situation. So uh, are you now able to export all of the grain from the magazines in Ukraine? Is the Black Sea corridor sufficient, or uh, are you afraid that still there will be some grain left unexported from uh, from Ukraine? And what's the perspective about that for the next year? Thank you. Hmm. So, um, uh, as you know, the six months period of the grain deal uh, concluded uh, between um ukraine un uh, turkey and uh, russia has um, has expired um and uh, uh, after this expiration days of course uh, un uh, has raised in front of the russian federation the question of uh, the question of prolongation of this uh, of this deal while ukraine of course declared that we are continuing ensuring necessary security measures for that uh, security measures for that. And uh, uh, it's very important that we do not negotiate directly with the Russian Federation. It is UN and Turkey who are parts uh, of this dialogue with the Russian Federation and separately parts of the dialogue with uh, with Ukraine. So we declared immediately from our side this, uh, this um, uh, commitment. And uh, uh, finally, after some, uh, some negotiations, Russia agreed also on their side. And this deal has has been prolonged for uh, additionally for four months. Um, and uh, uh, of course, we will request this prolongation as long as, uh, uh, as it is needed until the Black Sea is fully secure and unblocked by the Russian um, and filtered uh, from, from the Russian missile and military presence. Thank you. I move now to Guillaume Laurent, and I will take just after the question from Francis Gelipter. Ah. So, uh, Guillaume Laurent, the floor is yours. Ah, a problem for connecting, Monsieur Laurent. Ah, you okay. Will just to read his question. Okay. So, I will read the question from Guillaume Laurent, who is working with NG. What are the main changes you anticipate on Ukraine's energy system uh, slash sector on the long term? following the ongoing period of short-term reconstruction efforts. So that's a question from Guillaume Laurent. And uh, I give the floor to Francis uh, Gelipter and be back to you, Prime Minister. Mr. Gelipter, the floor is yours. So I'll try to be uh, short. Um, uh, I'll try to be short. Uh, uh, of course, we remain resilient because of, we have a very well coordinated process of uh, um, reconstruction of energy infrastructure with our uh, European partner uh, industries and partner governments. So, so it enables us to work faster and more efficient. But at the same time, more than 35% of all uh, the energy infrastructure, which is uh, the largest in Europe, basically, has been destroyed. And um, many of the regions in central U Ukraine are um, uh, in the in the in the blackout uh, uh, in the blackout uh, format. So uh, this uh, reconstruction takes uh, a significant period of time. But in case of a more massive missile attacks, we might be caused uh, much more significant um, damages, which would uh, uh, require more than one month reconstruction period, which in the winter time could be um, uh, could be uh, essential and vital. Uh, and we should not forget about the nuclear power plant, which is still being occupied uh, by the Russian Federation uh, in, uh, in Zaporizhia. Uh, the, military, uh, uh, the military base basically has been uh, developed there and uh, there's no room for them to um, for them to take any decision a part of withdrawal from the Zaporizhia power plant. But they use this nuclear blackmail uh, uh, as a major uh, instrument of their influence. So it's absolutely important that they could 
um, uh, take into account the MAGATE recommendations and get out of the area to make sure that we can um, guarantee the secure nuclear zone. Thank you. Uh, I try again to give the floor to Mr. Gelipter. Are you okay for your question now? The floor is yours, Mr. Gelipter. Apparently, we have a problem of connection. So I will move to uh, Elena Lubinsky just after, but let me ask you a question to, to let uh, Elena to be prepared. Um, we, we had different phase since February 2022, um, and one very important phase was last September uh, with the uh, Russian decision to make the military, the partial military mobilization, uh, annexation of uh, the four uh, regions, and the fact that on the military, uh, in the military terms, um, uh, Ukraine reconquered uh, Kherson. Uh, my question is, in fact, to know uh, if you have observed uh, a change in the Russian behavior, uh, in the Russian attitude on the field since uh, September uh, 2022. Put in other words, uh, in the way of uh, warfare, uh, have you observed a new attitude from the Russian troops since the mobilization? Prime Minister, the floor is yours, and after that I will move to uh, Elena Robinsky. Thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, two points. First, uh, first point that uh, additional mobilization, uh, partial mobilization, uh, only mounted the number of uh, uh, of Russian troops which has been uh, killed, uh, which died uh, uh, in this uh, in this war, and has led to uh, zero uh, military uh, successes uh, of Russia on the battlefield, as you just mentioned, the Kherson itself. Uh, secondly, uh, speaking about the changes since September, um, uh, it's very important. One thing has changed: uh, the gap between Russian declarations and actual situation on the battlefield has changed enormously. So uh, there has been a declaration that, uh, that uh, uh, four Ukrainian regions has been declared as part of the Russian Federation just in the moment when we deoccupied uh, the areas which has been declared um, uh, annexed. Uh, secondly, uh, additional mobilization had to concentrate additional military force on a Kherson direction to proceed uh, with the um, uh, with the further annexation of all the area, instead, instead Russian troops were running away closer to Crimea, uh, uh, thrown by Ukrainian armed forces. So the only thing which has changed is the huge gap between political declarations Russians are making for their internal audience and for their people and the lies they do and the real situation on a battlefield and the real situation um, uh, well, and the reality, I would say, and the reality. So there, there is a difference, and this gap has uh, been huge since uh, that period you've mentioned. Thank you very much. Elena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam Minister, for, for this encounter. I, I wanted to talk a bit about the European um, accession of uh, of Ukraine and its candidate status that was given this year. Um, and I know that there are 35 um, chapters and, uh, and six main clusters that have to be discussed, being mainly around acquis communautaire and democratic values and practices. Um, and that require some sort of policy that can be very long uh, and, and costly. And this year's Freedom House Index still shows that Ukraine scores as partly free uh, because it still sees corruption and some weak democratic institution and weak democratic judiciary um, processes being observed. And I wanted to know a bit about uh, what you think are the main integration processes that Ukraine will have to work on. Um, and do you believe that the pre-accession assistance aid uh, that, will, that the EU will, will confer um, in the future to, to Ukraine will be enough to manage those policy changes? Thank you. Thank you. Prime, Prime Minister, over to you. Um, thank you so much for this question. Uh, I, I will just 
put it uh, this way, is that uh, Ukraine uh, itself at this stage uh, deter defines the speed of the accession process. And I will tell you why. It's because uh, the ball is uh, on our field and uh, it is us who have to show the commitment to reforms agenda and compliance with the full compliance with the Copenhagen criteria. So I fully do not agree with your message that we have a step back in the judiciary and etc. It is not true at all. In fact, we have zero, zero tolerance to any vested interest in Ukraine. And here we have managed to um, start and complete the selection procedure for all the judicial corps already in March on the shellings and the, the bombshells. So the spirit of this country and the commitment of this country is absolutely different. We have some pending issues. They are very, very well on track. We will complete appointment of all the leaders and uh, directors of the anti-corruption institutions so, and the judicial institutions. This process has launched and will be completed under full supervision and uh, uh, engagement of international experts in a full transparency. So um, uh, there is a long way to go, but we understand that it is our commitment. And I, I'm sure that if you will look closely and will get interested in the real progress in the rule of law sector of Ukraine, you will see that we are uh, in a very historical moment where we deliver as much as we were not delivering over the years before. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Prime Minister. Uh, because the time is running, I will read uh, three other questions on our chat. Uh, a question from Fabrice uh, Wellenreiter. Um, I want to know which goals you pursued, recover Donbas and Crimea, uh, which is prior, uh, and uh, Ozibosa. The second question is from Elizabeth Maimaran. What is your frank assessment of how the West has performed so far in its support of Ukraine? What have been the good and the less than good aspects? And the third and last question in our Q&A uh, chat is from Stefan Dunikovsky. What is being done now during wartime in order to communicate towards the Ukrainian population about entering the European Union? Is it a priority for the population to focus on this matter? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, could you please repeat the first question? I didn't get it yeah. fully. The first one is about uh, what are your goal, uh, the goals that you are pursuing? Recover Donbass and Crimea. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, the questions could be, uh, could be answered in a blitz format. Uh, we have a sovereign uh, Ukraine in its internationally recognized borders, uh, which gained its sovereignty, regained its sovereignty in 1991, and these borders has not been changed in any other way. So uh, it is absolutely clear that Donetsk, Lugansk, and Crimea are the territory of Ukraine, and uh, in this sense, the full-scale war has equalized all the occupied and non-occupied territories of Ukraine, and we already um, uh, already declared that regaining back our territorial integrity and sovereignty is the beginning of the end of this war and the victory of Ukraine. Uh, second question was about the support of uh, international partners. Uh, indeed, uh, there's been a message uh, on your side that the process uh, of this war, the war has been a very dynamic and the situation has been changing. Uh, uh, indeed, um, having the understanding that uh, support of international partners is vital not only for Ukraine, but for Europe, uh, uh, for Europe itself, um, it was very essential that all of the European and transatlantic democratic nations has been um, unified in standing with Ukraine from the day one and supporting us militarily, economically, and putting uh, the strongest possible uh, sanctions on the, on the Russian Federation. All of these measures and all of this unity has helped us to survive and to fight back. But at this stage, we need a more strategic approach to making sure that it is us who are setting the timelines for this war to be ended and for the victory of Ukraine to be celebrated again. And we call on a more coordinated and strategic assessment 
of the support which could be done through political and diplomatic channels and through military channels and through geopolitical decisions to be taken to make sure that the war is over and no appetite for other wars is there, not against Ukraine or any other nation, including NATO one. Thank you very much. We we are um, approaching the the end of this uh, of this conference. So I I, I would um, would like to add an ultimate question, which is partly related to what you have just said. Um, how would you define? Because your very first sentence, which is uh, your main message, I think it is to say that Ukraine is winning. Um, what would be your definition of uh, uh, Ukraine's victory? And consequently, what should be your definition of uh, Russian's uh, defeat? Well, uh, uh, we should understand that I'm not the chief of command, right? And 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 um, uh, and uh, it's it's hard for me to give any definitions. Uh, but uh, when we are talking about the victory of Ukraine, we are also talking about more geopolitical context of this victory, and we are taking it into the account. And speaking about uh, victory in the technical terms, of course, is restoration of Ukraine's territorial integrity and, sover and sovereignty. And this is the first. Uh, the first stage of Ukrainian victory, but the second essential element is making sure that uh, no other war will be brought to our soil soon or any other country of, uh, of Europe. So uh, accountability of the Russian Federation is a second very important element and uh, making sure that restoration of Ukrainian territorial integrity and borders uh, will be uh, also considered as a first stage of the victory by all the international partners is essential to proceed with other geopolitical decisions on Ukraine, but also on Russia. Thank you very much for your uh, answers. Thank you very much for your time, Prime Minister. I think it was uh, very useful for all of us to get your, your insights and your uh, analysis. Thank you uh, I would so like, much. I would like to, to thank also uh, our um, partner and friends uh, from the New, New European Center, uh, uh, Alona, Leo, and, and Sergei. And uh, we do hope, uh, Prime Minister, to welcome you uh, at IFRI when you are uh, in Paris. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Alex. Thank you. It was a great discussion. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.